Hello, welcome. My name is Robert Flint. Welcome to this first sharing session that I'm going to give on Toy B. Uh, I'm a designer uh, and I'll tell you a bit more about the studio that I founded in 2015 and Richards. So the index, what are we going to discuss today? Uh, in the beginning, I will give a short introduction. Uh, my specialty is uh, movements and how to translate uh, movements into evoking certain emotions. So I'll, I'll introduce you the topic of emotion and movement design. Uh, then I'm going to tell you a bit about environmental enrichment and how a physical space is influencing your brain. Uh, then I'll tell you a bit about product design, uh, about the prototyping process uh, and the designs that uh, we've been creating in the studio. Later on I'll tell you a bit more about interior design, about the holistic view on how you can design uh, an office for well-being. Uh, and at the end, there's space for Q&A. So feel free to uh, make notes uh, and ask all the questions that are crossing your mind at the end of this session. Um, yeah, so who am I? Uh, I'm Robert Flint um, and I'm living in the Netherlands. I'm born and raised uh, there. And when I was in, at high school, I always wanted to be a filmmaker. Uh, so here we see a video of a Converse commercial that I've been making uh, in high school. Um, yeah, apart from making films, I was also very interested in architecture and art uh, and design. Um, and unfortunately, I did not manage to apply for the Film Academy successfully after high school. Uh, so therefore, I applied for architecture. Parallel to architecture, I also uh, worked as an artist and I uh, worked on paintings that I called interactionistic. And basically what interactionism means is that uh, you have a painting and by having several in the same space, in the corner or opposite from each other, and you make the portraits look at each other, uh, you make them interact uh, and therefore you create time. Because uh, as a viewer you can look at the left and the right uh, and depending on where you stand, also the direction of the of where the painting is looking at can change. So interactionism is what I've worked on. Um, yeah, these are some images of the architecture I've been making at uh, my school. I studied TU Delft from 2007 to 2011. I did my bachelor's there. After my studies architecture in Delft, I went to work at uh, Realizer Shanghai. And after my experience of working in uh, Shanghai, uh, where I also learned a little bit of Chinese, Wada Han Yu Mama Hu um, I went back to the Netherlands to do my master's at Design Academy Eindhoven. Uh, this is a project about creating architecture with balloons. Uh, and I graduated with the bionic chair, which is a project I will emphasize a bit more on later in the project. Um, if you want to uh, see more of the creations that I'm making, um, we have an Instagram account called at and Richards Low Score Studio. Uh, and every Friday, uh, I'm posting their videos uh, and some of them are videos on where I'm dancing. Dancing is something I really like to do uh, and I also try to integrate as much as possible in my work. So with this sharing session I'm going to start with telling you something about the relation between emotions and movements. I started this topic when I was doing my graduation at the Design Academy Eindhoven. My thesis was called Creatures and Creation and Their Segregation of Joy. Uh, it all started with the observation that we create very interesting and nice leisure environments, uh, theme parks, uh, we go on holiday, we make amazing resorts. Uh, but the place where we are the majority of our lives uh, is for the majority of people in uh, modern society an office type of environment, a place with a desk, a computer and a chair. But we as people uh, spending there more than eight hours a day have also other needs with emotions, uh, we have a certain need to interact with each other uh, and a very good example to me about how these uh, office environments are designed very much to function as objects but not to facilitate the people um, is this movie. In this movie you see uh, a guy who wants to use a printer uh, and that's a very basic thing that most of us will use when we are uh, at the office. Uh, but what happens when the printer doesn't work? Uh, you have two options. You either repress your emotions uh, and you act as if nothing is really going on, or you're going to express your feelings. 
And then the whole thing comes when you decide to express your feelings, uh, to express, for example, frustration and anger. You see what kind of a huge taboo there is in the office on expressing that. You see how, how fearful the women are towards the men because it's such an unpredictable emotion uh, that they don't really know how he's going to interact with, with them and if he's going to do them harm. So my dilemma with offices is that um, we design them very much uh, to function, uh, but not to make us humans express our emotions. And it's not that we switch our emotions off when we are at work, we still have them. So my uh, research topic was how can you think about an office environment as a place where you can also express your emotions while you work. So how can you make the expression of emotions into something functional that you can utilize in the office environment? Um, hereby, I'm, I, want to, I want you guys to think a bit about uh, this topic uh, with a little, a little exercise. Uh, and the exercise is, first of all, to think what activity makes you most happy. Write it down. What is the activity that you feel most excited about? When was the last time you had a very great laugh? What kind of thing were you doing? Second of all, what is the environment that makes you feel most awkward? What is the place where you just don't feel comfortable? Uh, is it, for example, uh, at school? Is that uh, at work? Is that at a certain place in the city, is it a certain occasion, for example, in the disco where you need to dance. Just write it down, the place where you feel most awkward. The third thing I want you to do is to connect the two of them to each other. How can you do the happy activity in the place where you feel awkward? What kind of objects do you use at the place where you feel awkward? And how can you use them in a way uh, that you can express that happy feeling of yours? It's a little exercise. Later on, I'll give you more examples and maybe you'll be more inspired when you get stuck right now about this little exercise anyway for me a very good way to start this this process was to dance i really like dancing in my leisure time and i was wondering how is it possible that from dancing which is an activity that costs me energy i get energy and i get uh, positive feelings whereas when i'm for example uh, working on my laptop um, I, I'm very passive, my body is not moving a lot, but somehow it costs me a lot of energy to do that. So I was uh, very fascinated by how it's possible that dancing, even though it costs you a lot of energy, is also giving you a lot of energy. Um, and I was wondering, um, is it possible that the movements by themselves make me happy? So what I did during my graduation was I joined Scopino Ballet Rotterdam, a dancing company. Uh, which is uh, making professional dancing performances uh, and I ask if I can join it, if I can join their lessons. So in the back you see me with the, with the green t-shirt and the blue, uh, the blue uh, trunks and when I joined their lesson uh, I noticed a few things. Uh, one of the first things that I noticed was that there are certain movements that always give them a certain type of expression. For example, when you have a jump you first uh, go down, you go up. But when you have this downward movement uh, and you have to elevate yourself from gravitation, so from the floor, uh, you have this kind of frustration type of face. But like, and then when you go down, you have this face of release. So you release your muscles and you feel a certain freedom. So you can get some kind of happy, happy smile. Like this is kind of like something. So there's first an investment, an investment of force. And then there's the release, which you feel by going back to the ground. So this is a facial expression that, that's quite constant uh, when you look at this. Another one that I found very interesting was rotation. Uh, when you rotate, there's an inner velocity. Uh, so your blood is accelerating and it's going to the, to the ends of your body. Um, and it seems that after people are done with the rotational movement, they also have a certain release type of um, of emotion and there was one movement that was very constantly always giving a certain expression there was this riddle called and all the dancers were stamping so i went to the uh, physiologist called edwin fisser to ask him how is it possible that every time after the dancers are doing this choreography even if they do it several times after each other they all have to burst out laughing 
So what Edwin was saying was that forces and emotions are very much related. You can basically state that the larger the force is that your body has to cope with, the larger the emotional output. It can be either positive or negative. And a very good example of a design that's playing with uh, forces and emotions is a roller coaster. If you are inside a roller coaster and you go up, you might be very frightened. Uh, and as soon as you go down, you might scream like, Rah! and as soon as you go up, there's another kind of like, like force again, and then you're released. Uh, so a roller coaster is something that's constantly placing a lot of forces on your body. And as a response, your body is having fear, having excitement, having anger, uh, having frustration. So you have all these emotions combined with forces. So a roller coaster is a large and an enlargement of what also happens with your body when you're dancing. There was another research uh, which uh, is very interesting. It got published uh, around the same year when I was working on my thesis and it came from Aalto University. At Aalto University, they did a research on where your body is activated in case you're experiencing certain emotions. And a very good example of how this works uh, is something you see with anger. Emotions have a function. We all think emotions are the opposite of, uh, of rational thinking, but actually emotions make us respond very quickly to a very urgent situation. In nature, emotions are the things that make us survive, that make us run in case there's a threat or fight back. Uh, and anger is a very good example of how your body evolved to distribute energy to protect your body with an emotion. If you are angry, you get a lot of energy in your arms, in your upper trunk. And why is this? If you're uh, in a dangerous situation, the most important things to protect are your organs and your face. Because without your face, uh, without your brain, without your, with your neck being damaged, uh, without your organs, you'll simply uh, die. Uh, whereas, for example, a leg is something that, that can be harmed. Uh, it's still unfortunate, but you won't die. So you get a lot of energy in your arms and in your wrists to protect yourself and your organs, your, your head and your organs. Um, and if we look, for example, uh, at contempt, uh, contempt is an emotion um, that's negative and you basically get energy in your hands and in your brain. And if I look back at the type of things we design in the office, we have a keyboard and a mouse and we design them to make small movements. And if we're at the office, we use our brain a lot. So basically, your head is activated and your fingers are activated. So the emotion that we are evoking at work is the emotion contempt. Whereas if I'm working in office, I don't want to feel contempt. I want to feel happy. I want to feel positive. I want an environment that's providing me a very positive mood. And if you look then again at the scheme, happiness is a body movement, is a movement that the, the full body experiences. So the whole body is active when you're feeling happiness. This is also the reason why if, for example, somebody is winning a prize or if something else cheerful happens, you're jumpy because also your legs are very activated and your arms, uh, this is why you want to give a hug. This is why your, your happiness relates so much to a full body activity. Um, so looking at this scheme, the thing I wanted to do is create a product that functions based on full body movement. Uh, and this is the exoskeleton chair. Here you see a film of how it works right in the future. There right there. What do you think? like to see some prototypes because creating an exoskeleton chair is not something you do overnight. 
Um, you have to work with a moving body. Uh, a body moves in all kinds of directions. A lot of parts can move independently. So it's very difficult to have an, an understanding of, of what angles uh, the chair need to make, in what direction, how, how you should feel supported when you're displacing your weight. Um, so uh, I was very fortunate to have uh, my own workshop where I could get scrap metal from out of the, the metal workshop and weld them together, uh, use some old uh, parts, or old joints to make the movements. Uh, and by making and making and making, I slowly figured out mechanisms to optimize the chair its movements. Uh, this is the second prototype I made. Uh, the one you've seen before was the first one. And here you can already see that the it's a bit easier to enter the chair and the movements are a bit more smooth. After the graduation uh, I did at Design Academy, um, Schiphol Real Estate was interested in not only using this methodology and this way of thinking for designing a chair, but they also wanted to see it applied into a physical space. So how do spaces relate to happiness? When you look at evolution, around 7 million years ago, the first human species started to live on Earth. And it took us around 280,000 generations to evolve uh, as much that we figured out we can not only eat by going into the forest and eating fruits, but that we can actually plant them. So around 10,000 years ago, we developed, we developed agriculture. And agriculture changed our physical environment. We went from forests and steppes uh, to creating our own uh, settlements with our own food supply in our surroundings. We started to domesticate animals, we started to plant trees. Uh, so we had a shift from a natural environment to a cultivated environment. And from 10,000 years ago, it's around, it's, it's around 150 years ago that uh, a larger part of the population started to interact and to live with an urban environment, with cities. Um, and if you think about 150 years ago, it sounds like it's a very long time, but actually it's only six generations. So over a period of 7 million years, which is around 280,000 generations, it's only six generations that we're living in the current urbanized environment. And that makes you wonder, uh, if we have been living for so long in a natural environment, uh, our bodies have evolved for that. Our bodies have evolved to survive in such an environment, to perceive stimulus from such an environment. And there's a very interesting figure because it's not only in wealthy countries where we changed our environment very radically to an urban environment. Um, from 2015 on already, the majority of people in the world started to live in urban environments. And this number will increase. By 2050, uh, more than 6 billion people on this planet will live in a city compared to around 3 billion people who live in a rural environment and a rural environment is still not a natural environment so it's still not the environment we evolved for so my hypothesis is that uh, we don't give our bodies the time to adjust to this new type of urban environment with flat streets with flat facades with glass with metal uh, with stones um, and the main question comes, how do we uh, mimic what nature offers us and the stimulus that nature is providing to an urban environment? So our bodies are experiencing less stress when we're living in our urban landscape. There's one theory that's very well applicable to this new urban environment. It's called environmental enrichment. In the 1940s, uh, there was already a professor um, Professor D. O. Hepp, who discovered that his rodents, on what he was applying research for medicine to, uh, responded different to medicine when they were living in a different environment. Um, so he discovered that the environment itself is a bias towards his research. What happens? When you put, for example, mice in a cage, and they only have water, and they have only four walls, they don't need to process a lot of information. So uh, the brain of a mouse in a deprived standard cage only has 
a little amount of brain areas which are activated. If you compare this to the enriched cage, a cage with several floors, where a mouse also needs to walk a stairs, can run in a treadmill, where there are tubes that they can walk through, where, there, where there's a variation of surfaces. The mouse needs to be able to balance. It needs to be able to orient itself. Am I on the upper floor or on the lower floor? Uh, it needs to be able to run. It needs to be able to use its muscles uh, because a running movement is different from a walking movement. And so the brain of a mouse in an enriched cage needs all type of brain areas to be able to live there and to use that environment. Uh, and what happens when you're sick? The brain areas that you're using are partly also fighting the disease. And if you have not that many neuropaths and not that many active brain areas, uh, the, the plausibility that your brain is able to fight that disease well is smaller. So what happened with the mice in the enriched cage? They became older, uh, they were less likely to get sick, and when they were sick, they recovered quicker. So an enriched cage uh, increased the resilience of mice uh, when they were living there. But how do you create an enriched environment? There are five informational paths that Professor Jenny Morton from the University of Cambridge described in 2014 for being able to develop enrichment in the brain. The first element is a visual. A visual is the information that we perceive visually. And there are two types that we are currently uh, working with. The first one is spatial mapping. When you're going through a space, your brain is is kind of creating a mental mind map of where you are. This is a stimulative activity. Uh, the second one is called non-inclusive motion. These are movements that occur in your environment. Uh, they're repetitive and they are predictable, but they're ever-changing. And good examples of these type of movements are, for example, people who are walking on the street. Uh, they're clouds. Every time a cloud is passing by, it's different from the other. But you know the cloud is not going to do anything different than being a cloud moving away. So it's very predictable. It's not going to give you stress. So if there is a campfire, you can see the flames. They stay in the campfire. They're not going to go away. It's controlled. It's ever-changing. and It's predictable. So these kind of phenomena you see a lot in nature, but very little if you look at, at a standard room or at a standard street. The second one is motor. Motor is all the information that your muscles are giving to your brain. It can be information that, for example, certain uh, muscles are active, but it can also be information as simple as carrying a bag. Because when you're carrying a bag, you need to be able to lift it. And for being able to lift it, your muscles must give enough strength for it to be lifted. Uh, so also information about the things you're carrying with your body are, is information that your muscles are giving to your brain. Uh, cognition is the third element, and cognition is an informational path that's based on learning. So everything that you do in life that, uh, that you need to learn something for, for being able to do that, is cognition. So it, it's, it's things that are challenging and skill-based. So it can be learning a new language, learning a music instrument, but also being able to, to balance or being able to understand somebody's body language. So it's, it's very much about learning curvatures. The fourth one is called somatosensory. This might sound a bit complex, but somatosensory is everything that your skin is able to detect. And it varies from, for example, the texture of your clothes, to humidity, to temperature, to pressure. Uh, it also varies to uh, chemistry. For example, your nose and your mouth, they're both made from skin and they're able to distinguish taste. They're able to, uh, to smell certain things. So these are chemical ways. Uh, of processing information through the skin. And the last one is circadian rhythms. Circadian rhythms sounds a bit complex, but circadian rhythms are biorhythms. And up to now, they discovered there are three types of biorhythm uh, that you have to take into account as something that's circadian. What's the meaning of circadian? Circadian means daily, so based on a daily cyclus, and the rhythm is something that's ever repeating. Humans, they have a circadian rhythm between 23 and 25 hours a day. So everyone is somewhere in between there. And this is also the reason if you're, for example, having a, a circadian rhythm of, of 23 and a half hours, basically your body doesn't need 24 hours, um, but 23 and a half per day. So these are the type of people that wake up 
uh, easily in the morning. Lots of people have circadian rhythm of 24.5 hours, for example. And these are people that tend to be more evening persons because for their biological experience, the day is a bit too short. Um, and the three type of circadian rhythms that we have uh, is first based on lighting. Uh, that's related to your melatonin system. Uh, so when you're going outside, uh, you perceive a lot of daylight and this is affecting uh, your melatonin system. The second one is nutrition. Uh, every day at certain times and certain hours of the day, you would like to have certain type of nutrition. Uh, so for example, protein in mornings, uh, other type of nutrition in the afternoon. Uh, and the last one that is covered quite recently is social interaction. Our body also has a certain need for certain types of social interaction per day. So what we do with enrichers is that we are translating these five informational paths directly into products. Uh, and when we design a space, we look what type of stimulus are present in the space and what are elements that we need to add. For every stimulus, we, uh, we sourced or we developed ourselves products that meet the type of stimulus. For visual, these were holon lamps, these were rotating lamps. For motor, it was, we designed a buoy chair, a chair that makes you move uh, with your full body movement. For cognition, we developed uh, the Bambata water sofa. It's a sofa with water inside, and if someone sits next to you, you can bounce up, up and down. And this is basically a conversation starter. Uh, so much to sensory. For so much sensory, we have this tactile wall from Alyssa and Ninka. Uh, it's a wallpaper that's inviting you to be touched. And for circadian rhythms, we use the light of his cable, the blue skylight, which is mimicking the colors of the sky. So it both has this bright blue uh, color uh, and it goes towards an orange. So and Richards initially started with a group of designers. Um, and all of us contain in our portfolio elements that suit these five stimulus. Uh, so with this team, we started to go to University of Cambridge to ask Jenny Morton how we can translate our prototypes into a work environment. I think this is this is a social this is a social interaction thing. If we were discussing something, mm -hmm. you know, as as we are, mm -hmm. and you're sitting there listening and you're you're playing, you're you know we we might be fiddling and going well, you know what are we going to do? What are we going to do next? And you. It's mm -hmm. not annoying that somebody else is fiddling with it, and I think this is actually quite a good table for that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Seems to work fine. Okay. Now, I have a, my mother's a ballet dancer, and I've been made to sit up very okay. straight, so I don't have an issue sitting in the door. <laughs> so I would definitely go for that. Okay, and, I, okay. and I sit straight. When I, okay. I sit on the front of my chair, and I sit straight. Yeah, this is interesting. That just feels slow and hard and uncomfortable for a long time. So I spend a lot of time sitting down. So this is better. Yeah. After we came back from University of Cambridge to test our prototypes, we further developed it uh, in our studios. Uh, and here you see what the design process looks like. Uh, so we had literally a bag of water that we used uh, to try and see if it works as a water sofa. This is a piece of fabric um, that had all kinds of cutouts to mimic a visual stimulus. And we contacted a supplier who had a bag of water uh, that we could use to create a moving floor. Uh, and when you look at the prototyping process, it's something that uh, contains a lot of dialogue. I believe that an idea is not in one person's mind, but it's in between people, their minds. So within the dialogue that you have with your team, ideas start to emerge. Uh, and for the buoy chair, we literally started with the idea, can we make a very simple egg-shaped chair? Uh, and from that egg shape, it evolved towards a stool with a metal ball underneath. And the moonraker started with a bag of wine. And by sitting on top of that, I figured out that it's allowing you to move and it's a 
easier thing that makes you move compared to a metal uh, mechanism. And from that bag, we try to create an experience that is that has the quality of a chair and both the quality of moving on top of a water bag. That same bag also evoked the design process of the Bombata, the water sofa. And the big difference between the Bombata and the Moonraker is that the Bombata is designed as a double seat. So when a person sitting next to you, uh, you have interaction. Uh, so it's not only a motor stimulus, but also a cognitive stimulus. Uh, because you're more likely to talk with someone when you share each other's movements. And the flow tile is the uh, moving floor. Uh, and it all started with uh, pins and elastics that can go up and down. And later on, when we were calling uh, manufacturers uh, who were making water beds for the Mbata, we figured out there's also a product that you can mount on the floor with water inside of it. So here you see the first prototype. Here you see the product that we sourced on the market. Uh, and we adjusted this uh, bag of water to suit in the office environment. So we changed it and adopted it uh, to be used in the office. Another thing that uh, Professor Jenny Morton from the University of Cambridge mentioned to us is that there's no such thing as one enriched environment, especially when you're creating meeting rooms uh, for at work. Uh, you have different types of people, different types of activities. So uh, she advised us to create three different type of rooms, uh, which all vary in intensity. So they all contain the elements of enrichment, but they vary in the intensity. It offers enrichment to people working in these spaces. Uh, and the variety we applied was based on the food scientist Moscovich. So we had a plain room. In the plain room, uh, there was movement, but little movement. Uh, there was a biological lighting, and we created a, a coulisse uh, that made the visual input that people received from a hallway, from the glass hallway, smaller. Uh, in the spicy room, we developed stools with large movements. There was the wallpaper uh, that people can fiddle a bit with. And we had a, a tabletop um, that changed light, uh, that changed color depending on the light that touched its surface. In the extra chunky, we went wild and we placed all the products and other prototypes there uh, that are never seen before in offices. So it was the elephant table that you can stroke. There was the flow tile, water floor, that you can balance when you're standing. There were holon lights from Jetske Michiel that were rotating and mimicking uh, a soap bubble. And we had the Bombata water sofa that makes you move when somebody's sitting next to you. So this was my first sharing session. Uh, I hope you have a lot of questions for me. Uh, we're entering the Q&A soon. So feel free to, uh, to drop me all the questions you're having and I'm more than willing to reply them to you.